Inflation, or the increase in the price of many goods and services across the economy over time, has skyrocketed. In some countries, it has reached record levels. Commodity and labor shortages, supply gridlocks, disruption hikes in oil prices, panic buying, shifts in buying patterns for some goods triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course, the war in Ukraine are responsible for the high prices. Individuals and businesses are balking at the high prices. Our dollars are buying less, businesses are spending more to operate, and our savings and investments are dwindling. At the same time, workers' incomes are not keeping up with the spike in prices. All reminiscent of Calypsonian PJ's hit, rice gone up, sugar gone up. The rapid and unpredictable changes in prices is a challenge for central banks and policymakers because it threatens the region's economic prosperity and destabilizes our social development. This is an issue at the top of mind for all Caribbean people. Therefore, on the occasion of its 50th birthday, the Central Bank of Barbados is the proud sponsor of a discussion on how can Caribbean central banks fight inflation. Our guests are Cleveston Haynes, Governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, Richard Biles, Governor of the Bank of Jamaica, and Caribbean economist Marla Ducoran. They'll examine some of the policy tools central banks use to help ease the inflationary pressures and restore price stability. Thanks to our viewers across the region and beyond for tuning in. I am your host, Tony Thorne, welcoming all to this special Caribbean Economic Forum. Good night and a welcome once again. Good night to all viewers tuning in from across the English speaking Caribbean and internationally to this special edition of the Central Bank of Barbados' Caribbean Economic Forum. I said before, this is a special edition. This is because the bank is celebrating 50 years of existence in this year of 2022. As host, I would like to take this opportunity to wish the Central Bank of Barbados a wonderful 50th anniversary. The Central Bank of Barbados is and continues to be a beacon of excellence, integrity, dependability, and sustainability for the people of Barbados and throughout the Caribbean. Now to tonight's topic, inflation, a theme which permeates news publications and productions currently all across the world. Our topic for tonight is how can Caribbean central banks fight inflation? And we have three amazing panelists, Governor Biles, Gover Governor Haynes, and Miss Dukaran, but she has given me special permission to refer to her as simply Marla. Good night, panelists. How are you? Good night. We are well. Very well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will start with our results from a survey that we did publicly. And I wanted to get your thoughts, particularly Governor Haynes and Governor Biles on this. To what extent have the increases in prices impacted your spending patterns over the last two years? 78% of persons said significant change in spending. 18% said little change in spending. And 4% said no change in spending. What are your thoughts on that? I'll go to Ms. Dukaran. What are your thoughts on the fact that 78% of persons have said that within the last two years, they've seen a significant change in their spending? I think you're on mute, Ms. Dukaran. I think that's the most popular phrase of the pandemic. I will. I will move on to. I'll move on to ask uh, Governor Haynes on that. Can you hear me, Mr. Okay. Grant? Yes. Yes, Governor Haynes. Yes. So first of all, let me uh, thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, as the bank 
celebrates his 50th anniversary. And a particular special thank you uh, to Governor Biles and to uh, Marla uh, for joining us. I think the, the results are not surprising in the sense that the, the region and, and globally, there has been a pickup in uh, inflation over the last two years. And I think it's important for us to understand why prices are rising. Uh, coming off of COVID, I think during the COVID period, uh, there was a dampening of prices, particularly for oil, uh, because demand globally fell and therefore oil prices fell. And what has happened uh, as we've sought to recover from, from the COVID pandemic and as economic activity has picked up, the demand for oil has risen and, there, and that recovery in demand has started to push prices up. And that has been complicated by the fact that there have been significant uh, disruptions in the supply chain, uh, which means that it's more difficult to get goods. So the, there's an imbalance between the demand for and the supply of goods, and that is pushing prices up. And the situation obviously has been worsened by what has happened since the uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict, because both the Ukraine and Russia are significant suppliers of commodities, both food as well as metals and of oil. And the fact that you have this conflict ongoing, uh, there are sanctions being placed on Russia, et cetera. What, what one has seen, therefore, is a further spike in, in, in prices. And we must recognize that within the region, 40% or so of our imports are attributable to food and energy. So if you have significant price increases in, in those areas, then that gets fed into our economies because the the, the Caribbean economy uh, is interdependent with the rest of the world. We cannot isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. And if we are importing 40% of uh, our goods for food and energy, then that is going to be reflected in the prices that we face. Thank you so much, Governor Haynes. You've explained that wonderfully. I'll now move to Governor Biles. What do you think is an appropriate target for inflation across the Caribbean? And are there significant circumstances where inflation can be beneficial? Thank you for the question. Uh, <laughs> could I first, though, congratulate the Central Bank of Barbados on their 50th anniversary? I believe this year we too have an anniversary we're celebrating. I believe it's our 60th. So we are twinned uh, in that respect. Um, so, what? range of inflation each nation targets uh, really depends on the stage of development and what their policies are. Uh, in Jamaica, uh, we have a pretty high debt burden. Um, and because of that, we run a major surplus on our primary balance, but also a small one on our fiscal balance. And that tends to be contractionary. Uh, uh, so on the monetary side, we try to be more expansionary. Uh, we have brought rates down really low. Uh, Pre-pandemic, our rate was 0.5% of our policy rate. And that tends to uh, be very accommodating and to allow businesses to expand and to grow. Uh, so for us, uh, inflation in a range of 4 to 6% is appropriate. It helps us uh, to generate growth, encourage business, uh, and nonetheless be able to uh, uh, deal with our high debt to GDP. So some amount of inflation is of use. It helps us to uh, run a nominal GDP that is uh, large enough to help suppress the ratio of GDP uh, to debt, uh, as well as it helps to stimulate the economy. Some economies prefer two to four, uh, possibly a different stage of development or different policies. Uh, but that is what we target here in Jamaica, four to six percent. Thank you so much, Governor Biles. I'll go to Marla. Marla, are you there? Thanks. Yes. Are you hearing me now, Tony? Yes, I can hear you well. Yes. I want okay, to talk to you about, Go ahead. about advanced economies and what are they currently doing to fight inflation and what's your pulse on that? Can they be doing more? 
Um, are they doing a good job? Please share this with us. Thanks. Um, so in the first place, uh, the developer will found itself last year dealing with an economic rebound that was so strong that it was considered overheating by many policymakers. And that is the recovery in jobs and spending was causing demand driven inflation in the advanced economies. In the US in March this year, the Federal Reserve hiked its benchmark borrowing rate for the first time since late 2018 increasing it by a quarter percentage point. And yesterday they raised the policy rate again in the US, this time by half a percentage point to get a handle on the worst inflation that America has seen in 40 years. It's the first time in 22 years that the Fed has hiked rates this much. And officials have also signaled that they will release a plan for shrinking their nine trillion US dollar balance sheet starting in June. And this policy will further push borrowing costs up. So this two pronged approach to cool off the economy is expected to continue throughout this year. And several policymakers in the US have said that they hope to get interest rates above 2% by the end of this year. So taken together, this, these moves could prove to be the fastest withdrawal of monetary support in decades in the US. Turning to Europe, according to their central bank president, um, after one of the steepest contractions in GDP ever recorded in peacetime, we have seen the steepest recovery in GDP on record. Employment has never fallen by so much and then rebounded so quickly. And setting aside the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war, the economy in Europe has been on track to achieve a greater utilization of resources and a tighter labor market than before the pandemic. And the last time the Euro area saw unemployment rates at today's levels was in the 1970s. So they're also seeing, we're also seeing overheating as well as of last year. They began in December last year with a step-by-step -step reduction in the pace of asset purchases. And they also adjusted their communication strategy and their medium term goal for inflation is 2%. So, both in the US and in Europe and other advanced economies, their inflation began last year, it was demand driven. It has now started to become more supply side driven as, as Governor um, Haynes had discussed earlier about oil price hikes. And so in a nutshell, this is coming from both demand and supply, demand first and now supply side, whereas ours is quite different and it's mostly supply side driven. Um, what more can be done? I think the efforts to address Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which don't stop at sanctions, which sanctions really have never worked anyway, is what I think is needed. But I'm just an economist, not an international relations expert. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Marla. I will go to Governor Biles. This is this is a quite a mouthful of a question, but it's it's something that we're very curious about, Governor Biles. In the February twenty first press statement of twenty twenty two, you, Mr. Richard Biles, reaffirmed the Bank of Jamaica's commitment to fulfilling its mandate of price stability. The annual point to point inflation rate in Jamaica reached an eleven year high of eleven point three percent. The Bank of Jamaica raised interest rates four times since September 2021. The last time I hosted the CEF, we lauded the performance of the Jamaican economy and we continue to do so. What has been your recent experience with inflation targeting and what are the measures you think are needed to improve the experience? A lot to take Thank in, Governor Wells. Yes, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, I should get bonus points for this one. Yes, you uh, so will. Jamaica, you will. Thank you. Jamaica is unique in the English speaking Caribbean in that we have uh, um, adopted inflation targeting as our main mandate in the central bank. Uh, we did this back in 2020 um, when we became an independent central bank. So, how do we impact 
uh, inflation? Well, we use a number of tools. One is that we adjust our policy rate. Uh, and what that does is it uh, impacts commercial banks' lending rates, their deposit rates. It therefore has an effect on aggregate demand uh, so that you know interest rates rise, cost of debt rises. It slows the economy. And uh, that sounds bad, but that's a trade-off that you get when you're fighting inflation. You have to slow the economy so that prices don't run away from you. Uh, it tends to temper expectations also. Uh, raising Jamaican dollar asset rates also makes Jamaican assets more attractive vis-a-vis -vis US dollar assets, and that impacts our exchange rate uh, and keeps it the volatility of the exchange rate quite low. Uh, so the policy rate movement is a primary tool and very important to us. Secondly, we conduct open market operations where we impact liquidity. Uh, so if we want to tighten, we take liquidity out of the system, uh, make sure that banks don't have enough liquidity to lend freely makes it backs up the higher interest rate and makes borrowing a little bit more expensive thirdly we intervene in the foreign exchange market uh, to the extent there is any unnecessary volatility as you know in times of crisis there's always a tendency to go for foreign currency uh, to be safe uh, and we have to try to minimize that volatility because that volatility percolates right through to the prices of the goods that we import. So we play a pretty active role in the foreign exchange market, not to set the rate, but really to limit the volatility. Finally, we use a tool of communication. Uh, and this is really important because what it does is it gives forward guidance to the business community and to the uh, financial system, what it is we are going to do, when we will do it, uh, so that they are forewarned and prepared. We also meet with special interest groups to answer their questions and to make our policies very clear to them. I would say that the experience that we have had in the last couple of, of months, uh, there are a number of shortfalls. And let me quickly just address them. One is that we have a pretty high rate of dollarization in Jamaica. So when you look on our deposits in our commercial banks, 43% of it are of them are made up of US dollars. And adjusting our policy rate, which is a Jamaican dollar rate, therefore has no impact on those uh, deposits. So that's one problem, the high dollarization. Secondly, we have experienced a pretty slow responsiveness of the financial institutions to the uh, rising interest rates that we have declared. Uh, we expect that eventually they will respond, but the asymmetry in uh, our commercial banking uh, uh, community where uh, we have couple of banks that dominate uh, means that there are there's not as much competition and they're they're not as responsive uh, to 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 rate hikes that we mandate and finally we find that in a period of some crisis the pass through of uh, uh, foreign exchange prices uh, to inflation uh, is quite is almost one to one uh, so in periods of relative calm, it is pretty low, about 30%. Uh, but in times of some heightened concern, it can get up to as high as 70%. And that means that our participation in the foreign exchange market is really important. I would end by saying the one uh, experience I think that we um, need to address in the near future is to get the competitiveness for deposits in the DTI sector uh, to be more heightened. The asymmetry is really having an impact on the responsiveness. And the next couple of years, we will be working on how to make deposits or, uh, more portable 
so that you can move from one bank to another very easily. Sounds sounds very interesting. Open banking. Uh, eventually, open banking. It take us a while to get there, uh, but I see that you're familiar but, with that. Well, <laughs> yes, Great. yes, I am. Um, my next question: What is the best in class? And this is this is this is something I think everybody is really concerned about: salaries and inflation. Um, so my question is: What is the best in class approach to adjusting or addressing citizen salaries? so that they're commensurate with inflation. Allow me to repeat that. What is the best in class approach to adjusting or addressing citizen salaries so that they're commensurate with inflation? I will start off with Ms. Dukaran and that I will then go to Governor Haynes to answer that question. Marla. Thank you, Tony. Um, I just want to highlight, first of all, that the pressure of higher prices is universal but it affects those at the lower income levels and those with fixed incomes like pensioners, it affects them disproportionately. And in these cases, I think the state must intervene to ensure that the disadvantaged among us are supported appropriately. On the other hand, wage earners who are currently engaged in salary negotiations or unions negotiating on their behalf will likely ask for wage increases commensurate with inflation. However, one thing is important to remember, that in the absence of increases in productivity, wage increases that simply reflect inflation and which are completely delinked from performance will only serve to make whatever you are producing uncompetitive over time and drive you out of the market, which doesn't benefit anyone. We have to ensure that when we are negotiating for higher wages, we are also adding higher value. I love that answer. Uh, Governor Haynes. Yes, so let me say that I share the insights uh, which uh, Marla have provided uh, in this particular area. Uh, essentially, you know, a wage adjustment to match inflation is really not a first best option uh, for us. Uh, indeed, it creates the risk of a sort of wage price spiral because once you once the wages have, have also risen, then that is going to be followed by increased prices. And and, and we certainly here in Barbados uh, have had that experience in the late 70s, early 80s, where we, we tried to match the the price increases with the the wages, and and, and all you had really was. Uh, very high inflation until probably the, the early 80s, and then it was able to, to taper off. But you come back to the problem, which I think Marla has highlighted, is that once you have uh, prices increasing rapidly, then those who are at the bottom will be perhaps impacted more because they spend more of their time, more, more of their income on food than those who have higher incomes. And, and what you have to appreciate here is that the supply shock that we are facing right now is impacting largely food and is impacting energy. Uh, those who've had a chance to read our, our last press release will see that many of the other categories on which persons spend have not really been moving very quickly. But the high ticket items have been food and, and energy, and that is what really is driving uh, the inflation rate. And I think in some countries, I'm not sure if Jamaica does it, uh, as one that is inflation targeting. In some countries, the focus is not on the headline inflation rate, but really on what they call the core inflation rate. That is, you take out food and energy because those are the things over which you really have uh, very little control. And then you try to focus on the underlying uh, in inflation rate. So in, in terms of how we address the, the impact of these prices on the average citizen is really to be able to find uh, targeted measures that are perhaps time bound because the food increases and the, the energy price increases are really likely to be transitory. In other words, uh, and, and those who have seen oil prices over time will seem that they're very volatile. So sometimes oil prices may fall to $34 a barrel. Uh, recently, they've exceeded $100 a barrel. They're likely to come back down. The expectation which the IMF uh, certainly has is that the, the, these prices will come down 
uh, later in 2022 and 2023. So we, we run the danger of trying to uh, have wage increases that are adapting to inflation, which is a, a sorry, or, or to price levels, which are a temporary cycle. And when these things change, you've already embedded those wage increases in, and therefore they're more difficult to reverse. So you need, I think, uh, transfers perhaps that are time bound. So you may be doing it for a particular period of time so as to be able to allow people to be able to adapt, but it is not a permanent uh, feature of the uh, government's expenditure or tax or tax system. Thank you Can so I much, Marla and Tony. Tony, could I just Go ahead, I, mean, I, think Clevin, I think Clevin makes some really good points there about it, you know, not being permanently embedded. Uh, in Jamaica, for example, in March, uh, where we recorded 11.3% inflation, fully 76% of that 11.3 was food and energy. And if those prices uh, have risen to a peak and have a tendency to fall again, it's going to have a very powerful effect on inflation on the way down. So I think that Governor Haynes makes a really important point that in managing uh, uh, wage expectations, which are genuine uh, uh, and you know need to be discussed and met, uh, we need to do it in creative ways that allows for when inflation deflates or when we have deflation uh, that it, we are not stuck with these high costs uh, up at the top. Thank you so much, Governor Biles. Thank you for answering that, that question, all three of my panelists, because that's a very pertinent question and I know a lot of people are very curious about it all across social media. Um, Let's go to the second survey and the results of the second survey that we conducted. How should policymakers better manage the increase in prices? 40% say introduce price controls, 26% say reduce taxes on goods, 18% reduce taxes on income, 12% subsidize the costs of food and gas, and 4% reduce interest rates on borrowing. I am going to ask the only lady on the panel to talk to us about this. How do you think, given these results, how should policymakers better manage the increase in prices? That's well, an interesting sorry. Uh, response. Sorry. No, please go ahead. <laughs> Tony, who is go ahead, please, Governor Biles, you go ahead. No, 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 no. You, 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 you go ahead, please. So I thought it was interesting that they said they we should have price, um, uh, basically limits on prices and price controls. I don't know that that's necessarily um, a policy that works because whenever you control. Uh, price and there's a restriction on supply, which is what we're facing now with um, some of the constraints we have with shipping and so on. What ends up happening, happening is that you end up with a black market. So that was an interesting response and I'm not quite sure how well it will work. But in managing um, prices in general, I and mean, the first thing I want to, to highlight is that it's so important for us to have the right data, robust and recent data. And both governors outlined what the March data is for um, Jamaica and Barbados. And in my country, we don't even have March data for inflation. Can you believe? We only have um, February inflation, and that was 4.2%, which is actually not that high. If you look at historic, the 13 year historical average for inflation, um, whereas in Jamaica, you have um, 57 percent inflation is 57 percent higher now in Barbados it's more than twice as high as the 13-year average in Trinidad it was roughly the same so that's the first thing sometimes we get caught up in the hype and we're not we don't have the data to actually validate whether or not there is a problem so that I, I congratulate both Barbados and Jamaica for having the data um, and so that's one thing that I think we need to address um, the other thing is 
adjusting our expectations based on changing circumstances. Governor Haynes just highlighted that the expectation is that oil prices should come down. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Energy Information Administration expects the average price of oil to fall to $93 a barrel in 2023. Already, it fell from 108 in March to 102 on average in April. However, um, the EU just announced that they are likely to impose um, sanctions on Russia that in in six months there will be no exports of crude going to Europe or being transshipped through Europe or by European ships. And then by the end of the year, even refined product, they will put um, restrictions on. And so that the very recent development as of yesterday, I think it was, means that perhaps because supply will be that much more restricted, that outlook for prices of oil coming down might need to be revised. So that's the other thing. We need to always be abreast of the data coming to us. Thank you so much, Ms. Dukran. And we are approaching our break. Please stay tuned. This is a wonderful discussion. As, a, as I said, inflation affects all of us. Up next, we have our social media moderator, Dr. Anki Scott-Joseph, right after the break. Don't move. We'll be right back. CEF is for me and you. Be on call it. CEF is for me and you. Caribbean Economic Forum. Move. Be on call it. CEF is for me and you. Caribbean Economic Forum. Log on, tune in, and join the conversations and engage with the experts. Help to find common solutions. first 45 years of the Central Bank of Barbados. It salutes unsung heroes who fashioned a modern society and economy and built an institution of which every Barbadian can be proud. Perfect for economists, business people, politicians, and anyone who wants to learn more about the Central Bank of Barbados and how its staff serves you and contributes to our economic and financial development. Download your free copy today. Did I ever tell you the story about the toaster? No, but I'll probably get a kick out of it. So I went to my bank for a loan for an overseas trip, gave her my documents, everything seemed to be in order. Then she says, Just one sec, let me check your credit history. The credit search shows you don't have a credit history. I'm 19, I just started working. I'm thinking, credit history? So she says, No problem, here's what you can do. Buy something you need on higher purchase terms. The credit information which you agreed to share will be passed on to a credit bureau which keeps a record of your payment history. Once you pay your loan off in full and on time, your credit rating will remain excellent and we could offer you another loan once you keep it that way. So what did you do? I went and I bought the cheapest thing I could find, a toaster. Went on my trip, paid off my loans on time and now I have perfect credit history. How you know it's perfect? I request one free copy of my credit report each year. Well, at least you get to know your credit's not toast. <laughs> so hardy, what I'll toast to that. 50 years of financial stability, building economic prosperity. The Central Bank of Barbados, living the legacy, continuing the journey, keeping Barbados strong. Together we can make it through any storm. The Central Bank of Barbados, celebrating 50 years of financial stability and economic prosperity. 
Welcome back. This is our 50th anniversary edition of the Central Bank of Barbados' Caribbean Economic Forum. The topic for tonight, how can cent Caribbean central banks fight inflation? Uh, welcome back to my panelists. We are going to go to our social media moderator, Dr. Anki Scott Joseph. Good night, Anki. How are you? Good evening, Tony. I'm fine, thank you. And good evening to everyone. In summary, the main message from this side is that coordinated efforts is needed between both government and central bank to lower the pressure of inflation. Um, much emphasis needs to be placed on retail price management and supply chain management. However, participants here are of the view that even when we address supply chain issues, when these are normalized, the real issues still arises. Low wage and high levels of unemployment. And there's also the supply side effect policy that is our propensity to consume. So controlling prices seem to be the main focus on this end. Um, Governor Haynes, one of the difficult acts is adjusting interest rates in an economy that's already weak and fragile and uncertain. And I'm sure you will agree with me that strategies, both monetary and fiscal, are required. But how practical do you think it is for government to revisit its approach to competitiveness, to stimulate comp competition, to encourage and promote lower prices, specifically encouraging bulk buying membership businesses who seem to have been providing lower prices? Thank you and have a good night. Anki, yes. I see directly. Yes, uh, I was saying thank you for that question, Anki. Uh, clearly, the issue of competition is very important. Uh, you know, we live in very small economies where often there are just a few suppliers, and therefore, uh, you know, our, all of our economic models tell us that that deviates from the, the perfect competition where you have lots of suppliers, lots of buyers, and therefore you're able to get. Uh, relatively low prices. So we, we face that as, the, as a structural feature of our economies, whether it's in Barbados, Jamaica, or wherever. Obviously, the smaller the economy, uh, perhaps the, the, the greater the, the problem. So from, from our perspective, this is where sometimes government has to chip in. But I think what people have to recognize is that government has very limited fiscal space in what it can actually do. Uh, price controls, in, in, in my judgment, don't really work uh, because once, and, and I think this is the point that Marla was making, so once you have price controls, you, you run the risk of shortages. And therefore, what you think is that you're, you're controlling a price, but you may actually not have the commodity at all. And therefore, that really is not the, the approach we want to go. Uh, going back to your chart before where you showed that people were talking about taxes and uh, both on goods and on income. And we have to recognize that our governments generally, especially coming out of COVID, um, have limited fiscal space and in some cases very limited borrowing capacity. Because once we talk about reducing the, the taxes, we also have to look, therefore, at the deficits that may ensue. And those deficits have to be financed. So we, we have to take an, an overall macroeconomic perspective. And I think that's the, the first point that Anki made of coordination between uh, governments and, and the central banks become very important because it, it's easy for us to look to think that the solution is for us to reduce taxes or to to whether on incomes or on, on goods, but we have to look to see what the impact is going to be uh, on, on the fiscal. So this is a particular challenge that we have to face because we have to remember that this is a supply shock. This is not something that is necessarily being driven by the domestic economy, but is really something that is happening from outside. And we are effectively importing the inflation of other countries. And in our case, as a fixed exchange rate country, we really import US inflation. And, and what you see is that the inflation rate in the US has gone up. And likewise, in, in our situation, the, the inflation is going to go uh, is going to go up while there is, is, is rising. So that goes back to my original point that we really have to look to see if there are targeted measures that we can utilize to be able to assist those, particularly those at the, at the bottom end of the scale, 
because they spend a large proportion of their income on food, and therefore uh, they're going to be particularly impacted by the spike in prices that we've uh, had over the last few months. Thank you so much, Governor Haynes. I'm going to break the rules of my script uh, and just go back to Governor Biles. I do know in the question that I asked about best in class approach um, to adjusting or addressing cities and salaries, you were going to make a point. Am I correct or am I incorrect, sir? Well, I, I thought that Clevy made uh, the point very um, eloquently, uh, as did Marla. So uh, that's fine with me. I, I would say, though, that uh, when it comes to Jamaica's experience um, with um, trying to alleviate the pressure of inflation on the poor, the approach that the government has adopted here is not to reduce the taxes, but to uh, focus a, a subsidy temporarily uh, on particular groups of people, uh, particularly those at the base of the society, students, uh, taxi operators who are particularly impacted by energy prices, uh, and households that consume a very small amount of electricity. Uh, so there are temporary programs in place that uh, uh, help to fund those rising prices. And because taxes are uh, often impacted positively by inflation. Uh, some of that subsidy gets paid by the extra taxes that come from inflation. Uh, so uh, that's a method that we have adopted here in Jamaica. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to you, Marla. Um, we have been hearing about all of these different products that come directly from Russia. Um, I'm going to embarrass myself and say uh, it's only today that I uh, realized that 40% of a, of a metal or a substance called palladium was produced um, by Russia. And that has caused a lot of issues along the supply uh, chain. Officials of the Inter-American Development Bank have said that the shortage of items on the global stage could actually present opportunities for Caribbean nations, particularly providing goods and services for those countries who have been affected uh, in terms of getting issues, receiving certain products and services from U Russia and from Ukraine. We also have Caribbean governments committing to produce 25% of their food supply by 2025. Can we identify what some of these opportunities are, as explained by the Inter-American Development Bank? Thanks, Tony. Um, let me quote uh, the CARICOM Secretary General, Dr. Carla Barnett's recent Salisis lecture as it relates to this, to CARICOM's plan of action that you just mentioned. Um, and this is what Dr. Barnett said. Even be before COVID, CARICOM had agreed in 2018 to target a reduction of 25% by 2025 in the US $5 billion food import bill as a way of stimulating economic growth and regional trade. This CARICOM priority is being led by the president of Guyana, who among the CARICOM heads of government has responsibility for agriculture. According to Dr. Barnett, intra-regional trade in manufactured goods and agri-foods has lagged well behind the levels of trade between CSME members and third countries, and the pattern of trade within the region is significantly skewed towards the more developed countries. Inadequate intra-regional shipping, high freight and other logistics costs complicated payment arrangements and unnecessary bureaucratic measures all serve to frustrate exports, especially from the least developed countries to the more developed countries in CARICOM. Why is it that the shipment of goods between Southern Caribbean islands and the US is easier to arrange than shipment between the Northern Leeward and Southern Windward Islands? Or so it seems. Studies have shown that resolving the transportation challenge in the region could boost intra-regional trade by at least 200%. 
And there is no doubt that affordable travel would allow for greater co-mingling of our people, thereby strengthening and feeding, feeding the belonging of, of, to a community, end quote. So basically, the challenges abound in realizing this goal of 25% reduction by 2025 in imported goods. And now that we have Dr. Carla Barnett at the head of CARICOM, we probably have the best chance ever of pulling off a greater level of regional cooperation, in my view. Already under her watch, we have a new protocol to amend the revised Treaty of Chagramas, which provides for groups of at least three member states to establish enhanced cooperation among themselves. In other words, a coalition of the willing can now move ahead even if the rest are unable or unwilling. I look forward to hearing about more progress under CARICOM's new leader, Dr. Carla Barnett, and she is the first female CARICOM Secretary General, by the way. So I am optimistic that this is something we can achieve if we all pull, put our mindset and if the coalition of the willing will move forward. Thank you so much, Marla. Um, I'm going to continue on the whole theme of Russia and, and production and, and how much of an impact um, these sanctions have made on them. Uh, Russia is the world's largest natural gas exporter and the second largest exporter of crude oil. The former managing director of the World Bank, Juan Jose de Boob, suggested that Caribbean governments increase their national budgets by approximately 20%. 20% in response to the economic effects of the Ukraine-Russia war. How practical is this for Caribbean governments to facilitate? I will start with Governor Haynes. From my perspective, not very practical. Uh, I think Richard made the point uh, of a few minutes ago that with inflation, you do get increased uh, revenues. But I think you, you, the, the general point which I want to make, which I, I made earlier, is that this limited fiscal space uh, for Caribbean governments, and to the extent that increased expenditure leads to increased deficits, there is a limited borrowing capacity. As you know, many of the Caribbean governments are are highly indebted, and therefore access to to new financing is not always as easy as they would want. So a lot will depend. Uh, on the inflation dividend on on revenue, because to the extent that you get uh, a, a large improvement in your revenues because of the inflation, it does provide you with a little bit more opportunity to be able to, to spend more. Uh, but it also might depend if the dividend is not large enough and you want to engage in something as large as 20 or 25%, then you will have to look at how are you going to finance it. And I think sometimes when we think of the fiscal, we think of the, the size of the deficit without thinking about the financing requirement because the, the financing is really what makes the, the deficit uh, hang together. You, you, if you don't have enough financing, then you run the risk of building arrears uh, into your system. And that obviously leads to instability. So from a, a broader Caribbean perspective, I would think that there's not a lot of capacity for increasing expenditure by that magnitude. Doesn't mean that we couldn't increase it. I think what we do have to do, however, is to be selective in where we spend our money. And we have to decide the extent to which you want to engage, for example, in capital enhancing, in, in growth enhancing uh, capital expenditures uh, versus other types. And the, the amount that you want to be able to put towards helping to defray the impact on the less uh, well off in a society. Thank you so much, Governor Haynes. At this point in time, I'm going to introduce our second intervener, our first intervener, sorry. Ayana Young Marshall, lecturer, International Business, University of the West Indies. And I am very pleased to see her tonight because she was one of, actually one of my favorite lecturers at UE. Uh, good night, ma'am, how are you? Good night to you. <laughs> I'm not allowed to have favorites, but the feeling is also mutual. Good night also to the panel. <laughs> um, congratulations to the Central Bank of Barbados on your jubilee. Um, and that represents, I don't know if people appreciate 
what that means, you know, in terms of your role in, you know, economic stability and development in Barbados. It's been 50 solid years. So congratulations. Now, my question um, it takes me back to the whole issue of the single market. And we teach the single market, the, we teach the CARICOM single market and economy at, you know, in, in all, all classes. Um, but my question surrounds the single economy. Um, so I teach my students about the promises and prospects of the CSME, particularly as it relates to trade, competitiveness, entrepreneurship, and employment opportunities for them as categories that can move freely. You know, university graduates can move freely. And of course, you know, economic development imperatives in general. So my question to the governors, um, is where are we with the single economy? Has it been abandoned? Um, is it a fleeting illusion? Should we stop teaching our students about the single economy? How do you think that the CSME could help central banks fight inflation? Thank you. Governor Biles? Well, I was hoping you'd start over the My and he would, you know, strike all of the sixes and I just come in with the singles. Uh, so I'm all in favor of having a, a larger market and pooling together our resources. Um, but I'm old enough to know that there are problems. We have been trying to pursue this dream for certainly all of my adult life. Um, and we have not been able to overcome some of the rigidities. At the same time, there are a number of small uh, nations that have shown us that you can become highly successful, uh, even if you are small. And I think the lessons that I've drawn from them is education, innovation, and management. Those three things, I think, are the resources that any nation, whether large or small, needs to be successful in today's world. It doesn't hurt if you have size and if you have a wide range of resources, but when it comes down to you know carving out a competitive space for you, for yourself in this technological 2022 to whenever, it really requires a very high level of education in the population a sense of innovation because you want to be not only educated you want to be on more or less on the cutting edge of technology so that the value added from what you produce or what you participated is of high quality and you do need of course to have good management and by management i mean of the country do the right thing at the right time stick it out those ingredients are uh, what Singapore took and built their first world nation uh, as we see it today. And there are many other small economies, Estonia and others that can boast a, a similar success. Thank yes. you. So I, yeah, I think I broadly agree with uh, Richard. You know, we have been pursuing the the dream of coming together for quite a long time, going back to the, to the Federation in 58 and, and even before. And we have to recognize that what we have is a very small market. We suffer from uh, this economies of, of scale. And it's important for us, therefore, to be able to come together, to work together in order to be able to grow the region. I think, and, and Marla outlined it uh, a few minutes ago in terms of the coalition of the willing, and we're beginning to see signs of increased cooperation within the region on economic matters. And, and, and those who will be following the discussions with Barbados and Guyana, and, and I think Suriname and so on, are seeing the potential for us to be able uh, to work together. And I believe that once we begin to see success, others will join in, in, in the experiment to be able to bring this entire region together. because. Economies of scale is what it is or what are going to take for us to be able to move forward. So I don't think that we have abandoned 
uh, the, the CSME, I think perhaps our, our path got a little bit diverted for a few years, but I'm beginning to see some uh, progress and hopefully we'll be able to build on that progress in the, in the years ahead so that we have a, a strong regional economy. And this is going to be very important. Uh, crises uh, tend to create action. Sometimes we, we need to do things and we don't do them because we're comfortable in what we're doing. But once you face a particular crisis, then you find that those who are responsible become uh, more active and they, they move a greater expedition to get things done. And I believe that that is what is going to happen uh, in the years as we go forward. Thank you so much, Governor Bells and Governor Haynes. Let's go to WhatsApp. We have a WhatsApp question. To what extent would fuel and electricity price increases have pushed up March inflation numbers in Jamaica and Barbados? To what extent would fuel and electricity price increases have pushed up March inflation numbers in Jamaica and Barbados? I will start with Governor Biles. Thank you, Tony. I, I just repeat what I said uh, a little earlier. Uh, our March numbers are quite astonishing. Um, we had inflation of 11.3%, and fully 76% of that was driven by energy prices and food prices. So that's where our inflation is coming from solidly. And I think the same, the same experience, the same experience in Barbados. Uh, if you look, you will see that you know we've had double-digit increases for both food and, and energy over the past year, and the, the the recent spike, obviously, in these prices has has impacted us. But you know that is the situation that we face. All all because we are highly import-dependent economies. Once these prices rise, then we are going to face. Uh, those those increases, the the, the Barbados government in its recent uh, budgetary statement has sought to cap the value-added tax on gasoline and diesel, and so that helps to temper the increase. But we have to pay for the oil, and therefore it doesn't stop these uh, prices from going up if international prices continue to rise. And and what you will probably see is that when international prices rise, we do get the increase with a little bit of lag, and when international prices start to fall, you'll also see the declines with a little bit of a, a lag. So I think around February, March is when the prices started to surge, and that's why I think you would have seen uh, significant increases in, in March. We are going to have one more WhatsApp question. I think we have time for that. Are central banks contemplating any adjustment of interest rates in line with the upward movement of international rates? What are the likely implications of increased rates for the domestic economy? I'm going to go to Governor Keynes. Okay. All right. So in, in the context, yeah, in the context of, of Barbados, as you're aware, there's lots of excess liquidity in the domestic banking system and the with that amount of liquidity in the system the natural tendency will be for rates to remain to remain low uh, as, as you're aware in barbados domestic deposit rates are less than one percent um, but they're rather closer to zero and that has had the beneficial impact of uh low rates low lending rates for example, mortgages are under 4%. This is, this is, these are historic lows. And that's because we have so much liquidity in the system. So at present, there is no uh, plan to raise rates in line with the international rates. But I would say to you that we also have to continue to monitor the extent to which international rates rise, because if there's a, a wide gap between domestic rates and international rates, it potentially could have an impact on capital flows. And that is something that we as a central bank have to continue to monitor uh, capital flows. But I would say to you that at present, uh, our thinking is that we 
will not need to, to move rates up, and that is speaking as May 5th, uh, 2022, we won't need to move rates up in line with the international, because unlike Jamaica, we are not a we're not an inflation targeter. Uh, we try to get our inflation stability through our adherence to a fixed exchange rate. But as I pointed out earlier, uh, notwithstanding a fixed exchange rate, you're going to be importing the inflation of the country to which you are, your currency is tied. Thank you so much, Governor Haynes. This has been a wonderful discussion and it continues to be a wonderful discussion. Uh, the title for anyone who is now joining us, how can Caribbean central banks fight inflation? Don't move, don't switch the channel. We'll be right back. Although we're called a bank, the Central Bank of Barbados is not like other banks. We are a statutory body and we work alongside government to safeguard the Barbados dollar's exchange rate with the US dollar. We also work with the Financial Services Commission to monitor the entire financial system. So even though you cannot get a loan or open an account with us, we are very important and are truly committed to Barbados's continued economic growth and financial stability. Each summer, the Central Bank of Barbados offers a student a chance to help change the world through a scholarship to attend the Caribbean Science Foundation's student program for innovation in science and engineering. It's designed for 16 and 17 year olds, gifted in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and is a replica of the well-known Mites program at MIT. We're nurturing young, inquisitive minds who could transform our economy, our region, and our world. Join the Governor of the Central Bank of Barbados in January, May, August, and October as he explains the country's economic performance, reveals economic policy direction, answers your questions live online, and brings clarity to how the economy works and what to expect. The Central Bank of Barbados presents the Barbados Quarterly Economic Review. If you miss the live stream, download the recording or the full text on demand at centralbank.org.bb. Welcome back to this special edition of the Central Bank of Barbados' Caribbean Economic Forum. As the Central Bank celebrates its 50th anniversary this year in 2022. Welcome back to my panelists as well. I am going to go to our second intervener joining us from the beautiful island of Montserrat. His name is Cameron 
KB, the Trade and Quality Infrastructure Officer, Trade Investment and Bureau for Standards and Quality Office of the Premier Montserrat. Welcome to this edition of the Caribbean Economic Forum, Cameron. Happy to have you. Thank you very much for that welcome. Uh, distinguished good evening to the distinguished panel and also the esteemed guests. Very thankful for the opportunity to be here. Governor Haynes, if I may, for the average person, inflation is primarily recognized in instances of high retail prices and commodities. As a region, we are consumers of a variety of products and services from the Americas and Europe. It is my opinion that the central banks of the Caribbean can provide guidance to the government to engage in mutual investments initiatives to achieve favorable purchase rates and even ease the individual burdens on our foreign reserves. Two initiatives I would suggest are the bulk purchases of fuel and the alternative sourcing of building materials, especially to support home ownership. My question, is there a reasonable approach, especially through fiscal policies to addressing inflation? And if you could share your opinion on my proposition, if the suggestions are noteworthy, I thank you. Thank you. If, if I understand your two questions, one is the regional approach uh, to addressing the issue of inflation, and I would say generally no. Um, the to the other aspect, I, I think to the, to the extent that we can engage in bulk purchasing then that is something that we ought to pursue. You know, and, and this is not only an issue as it relates to retail prices, but this is more of perhaps an opportunity with some of the, the large investments which uh, we undertake as a country. Uh, I know my own prime minister is, is very fond of noting that you know, all of our countries within the region uh, suffer from a uh, problem of decaying pipes, which is impacting the delivery of water systems. And therefore it would behove us to be able to come together, to be able to engage in uh, bulk purchasing of new pipes, et cetera, to be able to address a problem that is going to impact all of us uh, in, in the region. And so I think if you take that principle forward to the extent that we can, we can use it, and in some cases we have uh, retail companies that operate across borders. So therefore, if you have a company that is in Trinidad, that is in Barbados, that is in Guyana, that is in Jamaica, then that entity probably can engage in bulk purchasing and get the benefit of those, those lower prices. But we also have to recognize that these are being done by the private sector uh, and, and they're not really being done by the government. So you get the benefits from a private sector uh, entity that is able to operate across boundaries, but you will also still have within each of your, your boundaries entities which are smaller and are operated. And because they're buying small volumes, then they're not going to be able to benefit from the, the, the lower prices which you are suggesting. So I think we can try to utilize our conglomerates to be able to, to get that uh, at the retail level, but I think we also have to look to see what we can do at the governmental level, particularly with some of our larger investment projects. Thank you, Governor Haynes, and thank you, Cameron. Let's go to our emails. Oh, another question for Governor Haynes. I'm going to switch this up because I am going to ask uh governor biles to answer this since we just had governor haynes governor biles how has the foreign exchange fee contributed to price inflation in your opinion well i mean in jamaica we don't have a foreign exchange fee we have a foreign exchange rate it's a freely traded uh, um, commodity at all of our commercial banks you go there you place your order uh, and they bid amongst themselves for the foreign currency that is available. So every day there is like a auction uh, amongst people who earn foreign exchange and want to sell it and those who want to buy it. And the banks sit in the middle and they are the brokers that make the 
transactions uh, happen. Uh, so there's no explicit fee. Uh, you don't pay the price for the dollar on that particular day. Thank you, Governor Haynes. I feel as if I'm firing questions at you. I'd like you to answer that one now. Yes. So as you know, there's a 2% uh, for an exchange fee. And therefore, to the extent that the underlying price increases, then the 2% the will be on a higher number. And therefore, that will contribute to a, a higher price to the commodity, the good or commodity that you're, you're trying to, uh, to import. I, I think what one has to recognize, and, and, and these are some of the trade-offs, is that the foreign exchange fee really was introduced in the context of weak fiscal position. And what it does is it contributes towards the stabilization of the public finances. We anticipate that over time that will will go as a as a fee, but we still have to look to see if we replace if we remove that, what is going to generate the revenue that that particular tax currently uh, provides to government. So it's not just simply a question that you remove uh, the fee because you still have the same goods and services that you're providing. So unless we're able to reduce the cost of, of government, then we're going to be, need to be able to generate revenue, whether it comes from a foreign exchange fee, it comes from personal income taxes, it comes from value added taxes. Uh, there, there needs to be some mechanism to generate the revenues that will enable the public finances to be, to be stabilized and therefore we are providing goods and services which the citizens uh, so want to get from government. Thank you so much, Governor Haynes. Let's go to WhatsApp. And I must say that our social media moderator, and he's doing a great job with uh, moderating these questions. WhatsApp, the focus right now is rightly on protecting the immediate poor, but many in the quote unquote middle class have had to endure higher taxes and higher prices and are one paycheck away from falling below the poverty line. What can be done to protect them? I am going to ask Ms. Dukran to address this. Um, you know, I think it's really unfortunate that um, most governments in this region and, and indeed globally do not engage in counter cyclical fiscal policy, which is when things are stable and strong, you save. And then when things are choppy, you have something to rely on to spend. Um, off the top of my head, I know the Cayman Islands has counter cyclical fiscal policy in this region. I know Jamaica also has fiscal rules that ensures that they have more of a counter cyclical than pro cyclical fiscal policy approach. But in general, because we've traditionally um, had deficit spending, most governments in this region we don't have the fiscal space that allows us to protect the people that, you know, in that question we're referring to those who are actually already poor or one paycheck away from falling below the poverty line. And of course, the pandemic has driven higher levels of poverty across the, the globe. And it's a challenge that most governments are not yet able to fully grapple with. One of the ways in which, if you don't have fiscal is one of the ways in which you can address this current rise in price is by, um, I know the previous question alluded to the 2% tax on, on foreign exchange here in Barbados. If you remove that tax, in theory, it could bring prices down, prices of imported goods. The question though is, are these adjustments, policy adjustments reflected in the prices on the shelf? because it ha there have been instances where we've had price deflation globally in, on, on commodities early 2020 in the early stages of the pandemic, we had that phenomenon. Yet still, I don't recall seeing any adjustment in prices of goods on the shelf. So whilst we might say, okay, maybe we can flood our market with US dollars and appreciate our currency in the case of Jamaica, or in the case of Barbados, we can remove the 2% um, FX transaction fee and that should bring prices down. In theory, all of those things could bring the, the cost of the imported good down, 
but does it reflect on on the self? And that's really where I think we need to focus on. Maybe not so much the government addressing the poverty, rising poverty, and and the pressures on people's pockets based on taxes or other direct subsidies and interventions like that. Perhaps it's a question of how do we ensure that when we do and make any fiscal policy adjustment on taxes or even exchange rate um, adjustments that it's reflected in the price on the shelf. Making sure that that happens, I think, is much more important. And I'm not so sure we do a good enough job of, of that. Thank you so much. Let's go to WhatsApp. We have a question from, sorry, Facebook. We have a question from Facebook. What is the average inflation rate in the Caribbean? Governor Biles, I know you, you said you, you said what would be a was a good range, but what's the average rate? Well, I I think that uh, if you take Trinidad, which would be at the lower end because they are energy rich, uh, let's say a little over five, right up to, I think Jamaica would have one of the highest, 11.3. Uh, that's the kind of range that we are experiencing. I believe Barbados is clearly about nine, somewhere around there, and I'm not sure. Uh, so between five and 11. And I must say, um, the next couple of months, we're likely to see the impact uh, of inflation even more intense. Uh, so April, May, June, we're likely to see prices continue to rise. I don't know how much, but it's more possible that that will happen than for the prices to retreat. Thank you. Ms. Dukran, I have another question for you. What do central bankers and economists do if inflation continues to rise over the medium to long term? What is the likely impact on the Caribbean economies? Should inflation not subside? And how can the average householder assist in reducing the burden? Well, that, that's a lot of questions in one. Um, yeah. <laughs> what can central banks and economists do? I think, okay, so in the first place, we have demand-driven inflation and we have supply-side-driven inflation. As we discussed at length in this forum, what we are largely experiencing now in this region is supply-side inflation, meaning inflation that's coming from our um, trading partners and we're importing goods at higher prices and therefore the prices that we end up having on the shelf are higher um, over time. Uh, so reducing our import dependence is very important. I spoke a little bit about that around the CARICOM plan of reducing our food import bill by 25% by 2025. Another thing we could do is reduce our fuel import bill. And I think there are a million reasons why reducing our import bill in general is beneficial, but I think fuel is probably one of the most important things because the price of fuel, the price of electricity, the price of gasoline affects almost every other price in the economy because goods have to be, have to use electricity to, to be produced, to be transported, to be stored, to be delivered to the final consumer. So we really need to look at reducing our imports of, of fuel and therefore becoming more energy independent. And I actually want to ask both governors here, what are you as a central bank doing to reduce your um, energy footprint? And actually I want to, to share and highlight that the what I believe to be the first central bank to achieve net zero actually is right here in the Caribbean. Did you know that the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank right now already, they, um, because of their solar installations, they actually have 70% of their energy's needs met by their solar um, installation. And once they get their battery installation by the end of the year, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank based in St. Kitts will be net zero by the end of this year. And I believe they 
first central bank in the world who will accomplish this. This is an extremely progressive move. I want to congratulate Governor um, Antoine and his team. He's always been a very progressive change maker in this region, and I want to congratulate him for that move. I think that's living the change that we need to see to address this inflation. Thank you so much. Um, didn't know that about um, St. Kitts. Very, very interesting. Let's go to Facebook because we are we're very, very pressed for time. Um, let's go to Facebook. There's a question from Facebook, and I want to make sure that I don't only get my questions answered as moderator, but but people get their questions answered. So what are the open market operations carried out by the Bank of Jamaica? So <clears throat> open market operations really are is a mechanism we use to adjust liquidity in the system. So we have a system where we will uh, uh, buy or sell securities depending on whether we want to increase liquidity or reduce liquidity uh, and these could be securities these could be transactions that are done for two weeks or 30 days uh, and we do that on a regular basis uh, so that would be our main mechanism for uh, adjusting uh, liquidity sometimes we also do repos uh, uh, either from the banks or to the banks um, uh, but both of them in either case adjust liquidity one way or another and that's what we call our open market operation mm -hmm. thank you so much okay, here's the yes, sir. Yeah. Get some feedback. we have another question wow from email coming in Ms. Dukaran, can and should there be a more concerted regional approach to inflation? What should such an approach look like? Well, as, as I mentioned earlier, there should be a more regional concerted approach to addressing inflation. And as Dr. Carla Barnett mentioned, there has been progress underway to make this happen. Of course, this is not going to happen overnight, but perhaps the fact that we have this amended protocol that allows for the coalition of the willing any three member states can move ahead once they agree um, on any, any initiative that um, drives greater regional coordination. So I think we are likely some improvements in the level of intra-regional trade and other mechanisms for coordination. Also, we have, as of I think October last year, we have a private sector arm of CARICOM that has been established. So I look forward to um, more intra-regional um, coordinated efforts, not just to address inflation specifically, but to address many of the challenges we have. I, I am aware, however, that one of the challenges we have as a region as it relates to intra greater intra-regional trade as mentioned earlier, the issue of transport, but the issue of the payments space is very cumbersome when if in Barbados we have to pay uh, a supplier in Trinidad or a supplier in Jamaica for goods that we want to import here. We have to find U.S. dollars, um, buy U.S. dollars from the bank, wire those U.S. dollars to our intermediary, through our intermediary bank, sorry, mostly in the United States, to their intermediary bank. And then that intermediary bank sends it back to their, to their bank in their destination country. So you're talking about a minimum of four banks in that one transaction. And each of them takes time. Each of them has their due diligence process. Each of them will att attract a fee, will impose a fee for the work that they've done. And so by the time this transaction takes place and you pay your supplier from here in Barbados, you pay your supplier in Jamaica or in Trinidad, sometimes weeks have passed and sometimes 100 or 200 US dollars have been spent on wire transfer fees and also other fees associated with the transaction. That's a serious challenge that we need to address. Back in the 1980s, I think it was, we had the multilateral clearing facility in this region that fell apart because it allowed for a credit-based um, mechanism. 
but we have to work as a region towards addressing that fundamental issue of payments. And I would like to challenge our two governors here present today, as well as the other governors in the region, to address this challenge with a matter of urgency, especially given the issues we have now with inflation that, and, and with the supply constraints that we're facing as a region. Thank you so much, Ms. Dukran. I wanted to very quickly get um, some answers to your question about sustainability efforts and you know, net zero efforts by, by both central banks. I know that um, things such as working from home, not printing as much are, are certain little efforts that, that organizations across the globe are doing to be able to help with net zero. So if you can quickly answer um, both governors, uh, are there any efforts, just to answer Ms. Dukaran's question, are there any efforts that, we're, that your banks are doing as it relates to, to net zero? Well, I can quickly say no. In Jamaica, we have not really started that initiative, uh, though it's something that I am very interested in personally. And indeed, uh, two years ago, when I was with Timothy in St. Kitts, I did see uh, what he was doing there. And I think that um, to the extent it's an economically positive uh, uh, project, we would like to look at a similar thing here in Jamaica. Governor Yes, right. So I think we have a very limited uh, program uh, where we have also uh, started the whole process of incorporating renewable energy into our uh, mix of, of energy uses, but it's at a very limited uh, level. We would hope to be able to uh, increase uh, over time. I just wanted, however, to touch on the point which uh, Marla raised which is the whole question of payments, and to indicate to her that there is at present a, a system uh, for bilateral payments, uh, which is perhaps underutilized, and this is being looked at now by the governors to see how we can put some more life into it, because we recognize that we need to be able to make sure that payments can take place more easily across the region, uh, and to reduce the usage of our hard currencies, and therefore, that is something that the governors are focused on at this point in time. Thank you so much, Governor. I am going to go to both the governors in this question. The IMF in its recent spring meetings was concerned about inflationary pressures on developing countries and its impact on our growth and development and the poor. Further, they suggest urgent action by everyone what are the policy tools at our disposal to fight inflation and how do we use them to safeguard our economies and shield the most vulnerable? Kind of similar to the question um, that I asked Ms. Dukaran, but more a policy tools question. I do know we're very pressed for time. So if you could sync this into about 45 seconds per person, that would be wonderful. Please forgive me. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd quickly just enumerate again the policy tools that we use. We use our policy rate, we adjust that, and that percolates through to bank lending and, and deposit rates. We uh, participate in open market operations to tighten our loose liquidity. Uh, we conduct interventions into the foreign exchange market, and of course, we communicate uh, as intensely as we possibly can to say what our intentions are and the targets we're trying to achieve. Those are our main uh, policy tools. And Thank you, said, Governor. Our, yeah, our, our main focus really has been to maintain a fixed exchange rate because that allows us to benefit from low inflation abroad. Uh, obviously, we are facing a supply shock here and that makes it a little bit more difficult uh, for us to be able to manage the, the imported inflation. And therefore, that really has to be supported by other measures, non, non monetary policy measures, really, uh, to be able to address the question of the, the high prices that we're currently facing. Thank you so much. I wanted to uh, ask the final question um, for you, which will, I will ask everybody to, to, to answer. Um, where do you see 
actually, you know what? Let's go to a commercial break. We'll be right back. are back. This is a special edition of the 50th anniversary for the Caribbean Economic Forum brought to you by the Central Bank of Barbados. Once again, the Central Bank is celebrating 50 years and I am joined by my distinguished panelists. We've had a wonderful discussion thus far. We have Ms. Marla Ducaran, Governor Richard Biles, and Governor Claveston Haynes all across from the Caribbean joining us. Thank you so much again for joining. A pleasure to be here. Yes, I wanted to ask you um, my final question for you. This is my final question as a moderator, not necessarily the session's final question. And I wanted to say, given the current situation with inflation and other economic pressures, what is your forecast for inflation over the next six months a year? Well, I would say uh, next six months, pretty stiff. Um, before the Russia-Ukraine conflict, we thought that in September, we'd see a return of inflation to our 4% to 6% corridor. Then say Russia-Ukraine uh, war, we know that's off. Uh, and it's going to take us maybe another 12 months before we see that return of inflation to 4 to 6%. So we think that uh, starting the latter part of this year, we'll see, uh, we'll see prices start to come down, but they are not likely to get to the pre-pandemic level or near to that before about September of next year. Miss, and I, and I think that, Miss Dukran, yeah. oh sorry, go ahead, Governor Haynes. I'll end off with Miss Dukran. I know we're pressed for time. Yes, I was going to say that you know our outlook is, is similar uh, to Richard's. Uh, the the good news is that the the MF expects that oil prices will fall by about thirteen uh, percent next year, and food prices will fall by about five or six percent. So we do expect some tapering of the inflation, but the next few months. Uh, a lot will really depend on what happens in that Russia-Ukraine conflict. It, you know, it's, it's very difficult for us to be able to make very point forecasts at this point in time because there's a lot of uncertainty. And therefore, to the extent that that situation can be resolved, the sooner we think we'll be able to see uh, some ease in terms of the prices that we are currently facing. Mr. Grand, last but certainly not least. Yes, I I think um, like both governors um, mentioned, we expect inflation will increase. Of course, it will vary across countries in the Caribbean. We're not the same. Um, and as I mentioned, Trinidad, for example, seems to be having less inflationary pressure than, than Jamaica and, and Barbados. But I just, you know, in closing, want to highlight something and quote, that something Christine Lagarde said, she is the president of the European Central Bank. She said, monetary policy today is facing a new challenge. We are increasingly confident that inflation dynamics over the medium term will not return to the pattern we saw before the pandemic. Our outlook today can be neatly summed up in the words of Maya Angelou. We are hoping for the best, prepared for the worst, and unsurprised by anything in between. Love it. What a wonderful way to end this conversation. 
I had a really good time chatting and having this very important, pertinent topic, uh, the conversation with Governor Biles, Governor Haynes, and Miss Marla Dukaran. Uh, this has been the latest edition of the Central Bank of Barbados's Caribbean Economic Forum. I personally want to wish the Central Bank a happy 50th anniversary. You've been good to me, you've been good to the people of Barbados, and you've been good to the people of the Caribbean. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And good night.